Hello, welcome back. In this video, we will discuss about what are the causes of postoperative fever. The surgery of our patient is over and the patient has been shifted to the ward. Now, our patient is running fever. So, we need to analyze what are the causes of fever in this postoperative patient. Now, we will discuss the causes of postoperative fever with respect to the POD that is post-operative day. Start with day 1 that is first day after surgery, atelectasis or prolapse of the alveoli. This is the most common cause of fever on day 1. The predisposing factor for atelectasis include general anesthesia and upper abdominal or thoracic surgery with stimulation of GI viscera which can alter diaphragmatic function for several days. Now, presentation of atelectasis. Presentation include tachypnea, decreased oxygen saturation and use of accessory muscles. On physical examination, breath sound may be absent or reduced. Breath sound will be bronchial in nature. Now, how to prevent atelectasis? To prevent atelectasis, we need to make sure that the patient does just physiotherapy and Cuffing. We make the patient sit up and pat on the patient's back. Okay. Next, we can give bronchodilator therapy, hydration, steam inhalation, and tracheal suctioning. Now, just physiotherapy is usually carried out by using an incentive spirometer or deep breathing. Five sequential breath hold for five to six seconds. This is an incentive spirometer. In this device, which has three balls in it, you ask the patient to do this exercise so that it can cause a lung expansion. We need to treat CHF and COPD before surgery and make sure that when the patient is getting admitted, he should stop smoking before at least one week. But the ideal situation is patients should stop smoking before four to six weeks. If the patient is not taking a deep breath because of pain, then there can be atelectasis. So that is why one more aspect to prevent atelectasis is adequate pain management. Now, on post-operative day 2 or 3, if atelectasis is not corrected, then the patient can develop pneumonia. So this is one of the cause of fever on day 2 and day 3. Next, superficial thrombophilobitis. The cannula of the patient where there is swelling, right, because of superficial thrombophilobitis. Now, prolonged IV axis, bladder catheterization or endotracheal intubation presents ongoing risk of infection that results from disruption of normal post-defense mechanism. Post-operative UTI is more common in patients with pre-existing prostate hypertrophy. So, all these can manifest between day 2 and day 3. Next, post-operative day 3 to day 5. Between post-operative day 3 to post-operative day 5, the patient can develop wound infection or surgical site infection. So, wound infection or surgical site infection is defined as infection which occurs within 30 days of surgery or if an implant has been placed within one year of the surgery. So, wound infection can occur between day 3 and day 5. And this can either be superficial surgical site infection that is above the fascia and it can be deep surgical site infection that is below the fascia. And last, it can be organ space surgical site infection. Now, another cause of fever between day 3 and day 5 is DVT that is deep venous thrombosis. The virtuous triad that is venous stasis, endothelial injury, hypercoagulability describe the factor contributing to venous clot formation and deep venous thrombosis. Okay, so to prevent DVT, you have pharmacological methods and you have mechanical methods. See, pharmacological methods are more superior than mechanical methods. Okay, and the pharmacological method which we used is low molecular weight heparin. 
Now, the mechanical methods are early ambulation of patient and the use of pneumatic compression stockings. See, this is pneumatic compression stockings. They are tied on the limb and connected to a pump. And when they inflate intermittently, they prevent stasis of blood. And when stasis is prevented, DVT will not develop. So, up till now, we have discussed about the causes of fever in post-operative day 1 to day 5. Now, another cause of fever which is specific to abdomen surgery is burst abdomen. The burst abdomen occurs around post-operative day 6. Now, burst abdomen that is abdominal wound dehiscence when the rectus sheets open up. Now, the presentation of burst abdomen. We get the salmon fluid sign or the serous fluid sign. That is, large quantities of serous fluid come out of the wound. And that is what signifies that the rectus sheath has opened up. Now, how do we manage these patient? See, burst abdomen, you have emergency management and definitive management, right? The emergency management for burst abdomen is known as Eurobag or Bogota bag laparostomy. The Eurobag, we suture it with the rectus sheath of the skin so that the bowel does not eviscerate. That means, does not come out. And this is just a temporary measure. And because we have to suture it with the skin or the rectus sheath, we will usually use a cutting or a reverse cutting needle. Now, the definitive management is resuturing of the rectus sheath in a patient with a burst abdomen. We will use proline sutures. Proline sutures are non-absorbable sutures. Now, what are the predisposing factors for burst abdomen? The predisposing factors can either be patient related factors or it can be surgeon or surgery related factors. Now, the patient related factors are chronic cough, constipation, infection, obesity, immunocompromised patient or malnourished patient. These are the patient related factors. The surgeon and the surgery related factors. The risk is highest in midline incision compared to transverse incision. Next, risk is higher in emergency surgery rather than elective surgery. Now, burst abdomen is common in continuous suture than interrupted suture. But continuous suture are usually used to close the rectus sheath. Okay, problem is that if one of the continuous suture opens up, the entire sheath will open up. Whereas, interrupted suture might be more time consuming, but the chances of burst abdomen are less. Now, the final thing is, the burst abdomen is common in short thread compared to long thread. The length of the thread should be minimum 4 times the length of the rectus sheath wound. If we use shorter length, it can cut through the rectus sheath and it can increase the chances of burst abdomen. Now, the final cause of post-operative fever is intra-abdominal abscesses. Intra-abdominal abscess can manifest anywhere between post-operative day 3 to post-operative day 7 and beyond. Right? So, these intra-abdominal abscesses means collection inside the abdomen. The most common site overall for intra-abdominal abscess is the pelvis or the pouch of Douglas. In a supine patient, the most dependent position is the Morrison's pouch. If the patient is non-ambulatory or the patient is supine, then the Morrison's pouch will be the most common site for intra-abdominal collection. Or in an ambulatory patient, because of the gravity, the collection will be in pelvis or the pouch of Douglas. Now, clinical features for intra-abdominal abscesses. There will be spikes of fever with chills and rigor, right? And if it is a collection in the pelvis, the peculiar presentation is pelvic diarrhea. Pelvic diarrhea is that when pus collection is in the pelvis, it will irritate the rectum. So the patient is going to have increased frequency of stool. But the patient will complain that whenever he passes stool, it is mainly mucus with some fecal matter. So that is the typical description of pelvic diarrhea, which signifies that there is a collection in the pelvis. 
if there is a sub diaphragmatic collection then the patient can have cough or may have breathing difficulty now for the diagnosis of intra abdominal collection the investigation of choice is ce ct and last we will use a pigtail catheter to drain the collection if you like the content please subscribe the channel thank you